Hello everybody! In this video, I want to give a justification for Simpson's Rule. So, you may recall, uh, we talked about Simpson's Rule in class. So, in Simpson's Rule, you, you have some curve, right? So, okay, so I have some curve here. And let's say I want to know the accumulation, right, of this curve. So, maybe uh, we'll call this curve F. All right, and I want to know the accumulation between points A and B. And because maybe I don't know what F is explicitly, um, instead what I'm going to, do, going to do is approximate this integral. So I want to integrate F from A to B. But I'm only going to get an approximation. And so what I might do is chop this up into intervals, okay, into little sub pieces. Uh, and at sort of the endpoints, I'm going to uh, be sampling the function f. So uh, let's see here. Uh, in this case, I broke it up into one, two, three, four, five, six subintervals. Now it's actually going to be quite important here that I did six and not five or seven. For Simpson's rule, we're always looking at an even number of intervals. And the reason is because what we do is I'm going to, uh, actually I'll give a name to this first point. Instead of A, I'm going to call it T0, and then I'm going to have a T1 and a T2. And I'm going to sample the function F at T0, okay, that gives me this point, uh, T1, that gives me that point, and at T2. And so I get three points, this one has height F of T2, this one has height F of T1, and this up here has height f of t0. Okay. So I have sampled the function at three points. And what I showed in the Lagrange polynomial video is that if you have three points, there is an explicit way that we can draw a parabola through those three points. Okay. So I have a, a parabola which is going to go through those three points. And okay, and I stop there, right? Okay, then I go over to, I have T2, T3, and T4. And, and I'm going to write it again, but maybe in a different color here. So this is again T2, that's fine. T3, T4. And I sample, of course I get the exact same point at T2. I sample at T3, and I sample at T4. And once again, there's going to be some unique parabola that's going to go through these three points. And then finally, okay, maybe we'll call this T4 again. Why not? This will be T5, and B could be T6. And again, I sample. I sample at T5, and I sample at T6. And now, again, there's going to be some parabola going through those three points. So what I have done is I've taken this original curve and I've chopped it up so that it looks roughly like three parabolas. All right? So I have these three different parabolas and instead of trying to find the area under the given curve, I'm instead going to try to find the area under each of these three parabolas and then add them all together. Okay? So the claim is that if you do this in general, right, with an even number of intervals, then the approximation is going to look like, okay, well first, whatever number you get at the end, you divide by three, then you're gonna multiply by the width of these intervals. And I always make these so that they, they have the same width everywhere, all right? So maybe we'll call this like a little h, okay? So that's that's just some little width here. So all of these bases, right, They they have width h. So I'm going to take h, which is the width of an interval, divide it by 3. And then I'm going to take that number and multiply it by the following sum. I take f, I sample it at t0, okay, that gives me this height, and I just take that value. Right. Then I'm going to sample f at t1, but I'm going to weight this a little bit more. All right. This is a... Uh, somehow being in the middle, right, it controls 
the shape of the parabola a little bit more. And so I'm going to give it a, a four coefficient. Okay, This should be totally mystifying, like why I chose the number four, why not three, why not five, all right? But this is what this video is going to be about. I'm going to show you where this four comes from. All right, And then I go to F2, or F of T2, but that's going to get a weighting of two. Okay. Then I'm going to jump over to F of T3, and that'll again get a weighting of four. And I'm going to keep alternating the four, the two, the four, the two, etc. Okay, till I get to the end. Now here we had six, but in general, maybe I have n of them. So I'm going to have two times f of t n minus two. I'm going to have the so the the penultimate one, t n minus one, will have a weighting of four. And then the very last one, I don't have any extra weight anymore. It's just going to be a, a one weight. Okay, so the, the outer points are going to be underrepresented a little bit here. Okay, so this is what Simpson's rule says, and this should be a good approximation. So the question is, is where does this all come from? So if I was just doing uh, two intervals, so let's look at that two interval situation. So say I was just going between T0 and T2. All right, so if I integrate, I'm just going to say even from t0 to t2, f dt. Simpson's rule would tell us this should be h over 3, approximately, right? f of t0 plus 4 f of t1. And now I don't need to go into the 2s because the, the t1 and the tn minus 1 are actually now the same, right? Because if n is equal to 2, then 2 minus 1 is 1. So I'm already in this... This four situation, those are identical. And now I go to the last point, f of t2. All right, let's jump to the four interval case. All right, so this is where n is going to equal four. So I go from t to t4, f dt. Um, but what I actually can do is break this up. I can say, well, this should actually be the same thing as going from t0 to t2, and then going from t2 to t4. And each of these is now a two-interval case. This one goes t0, t1, t2. This one is going to be t2, t3, t4. And so I already know the first one should be, okay, we have h over 3 f of t0 plus 4 f of t1 plus f of t2 plus, okay, now comes the second piece, h over 3 f of t2 plus 4 f of t3 plus f of t4. And when I put these together, okay, know that the h over 3 is a constant that I can pull out. So I have h over 3. And now what do I have? I have f of t naught. I have four f of t1s. And now I have an f of t2, but also another f of t2. And this is where the two coefficient comes from. It's really two copies, one of f of t2 over here and one from over here. And it's because the t2 is the cutoff between the first parabola and the second parabola. You use it both times. Use it in both parabolas. So I get 2 f of t2. Then I have 4 f of t3s. And finally, an f of t4. Right. So this is why we're going to end up getting this alternating pattern of fours and twos. The fours are always showing up in the middle for some reason. We haven't explained that yet. But anything which is going to show up at, as an end sample point of one parabola and then the beginning sample point of the next parabola, that's going to show up two times. And so it's going to get a coefficient of two. Okay. So the only thing we really need to work out here is this two interval case. We need to understand why this expression is a good approximation for the integral of f from t naught to t2. Okay, well, let's try to do that. Now I'm gonna make one more simplification here. 
right? And let me, uh, I'm going to draw two pictures. So I have some curve, and I'm going to break up my interval into two sub-intervals. So I have a T0, a T1, and a T2. All right, that's sort of the generic case we, we want to solve. Well, what if I shifted this curve over to the left so that the T1 coincided with 0? All right, so I just do the same thing. Maybe make those bounce a little bit. Okay, so now the T1 got shifted to the 0. It's the same curve. It's the same height above the axis. And we know, okay, this was like a little h here, which means that this coordinate now, how far away is, this was our t1 and this was our t2, they're h away, but now this is zero. So that's h, and this is minus h. Right. So computing the accumulation on this in this right picture will be the exact same as if we accumulated it on the left. What makes it a little bit nicer is now this t1 is a zero, and and these two are actually there, there's a little symmetry to it. Okay, and the hope is that'll that'll actually simplify some of the algebraic calculations we have to do. All right. Okay. Fine. So we have some curve. Uh, it, it's uh, going to be part of a parabola, right? In the sense that we're going to be able to draw a parabola through these points, right? Maybe with our little blue line. And how did we do it? Well, maybe we used the Lagrange poly polynomial. And when we did this blue line is going to give us some function. Uh, let me call it P for polynomial. All right. And so our P of X is going to look like, well, okay, it's some quadratic. So let me do a generic quadratic. AX squared plus BX plus C. Okay. Now, we actually know how to compute the area under that curve. Right. So if I integrate from, uh, oh, I, all of a sudden I switched to X's instead of T's. Let me put T's back in here. Right. Just so used to X's everywhere. So T is going to go from negative H to positive H. And I want to integrate P. Okay, well, one nice thing uh, to note here to make our calculation a little bit easier is uh, if I integrate the a t squared part, that is an even function, right? The even function part of it tells you, okay, it doesn't matter whether you put in negatives or positive. So I can break this up. And the first piece, I actually won't even have to go from negative h to h. I can go from 0 to h, and then I'll get two copies of it. And, well, I can pull the a out as well. All right, so and then I just have a t squared dt. So that's the first piece. The second piece is a linear piece, all right? bt, and that's an odd function, right? So this was an even function, but bt is an odd function. And when you integrate an odd function from negative h to h, it gives you nothing. Right? Everything on the left-hand side is compensated for by something on the right-hand side that's exactly the same value, but with a negative. So the BT is not going to give me anything. And then finally, I'm integrating C. Right? Well, if I'm integrating C from negative H to H, it's just a constant. It's just going to give me the length of the interval times C. Okay, the length of the interval is 2 times H, so I get 2HC. Okay, and this is a very straightforward integral now. So this is going to be, let's see, an antiderivative of t squared is t cubed over 3. So I get t cubed over 3 between 0 and h. Okay, at h I'll get h cubed over 3, and at 0 I get 0. That's wonderful. So I get 2a h cubed all over 3. Okay, and of course I still have this plus 2hc. Okay, uh, I make one little uh, factorization here because I don't like having this over three there. So let me see. I'm gonna I'm gonna pull a third out, and I you know I also have an h in both of these I could pull out. So I'll pull out an h over three, and then I'm left with two a uh, h squared. And if I pull out this three, then this is actually gonna become a this two will become a six. Right? So if you put the 3, this is a third, you put it back in, you'll get the 2 you need. 
All right, so I have h over 3, and hey, h over 3, that seems familiar, right? Ooh, that's like, yeah, that was something that I kept getting when I did Simpson's rule. All right, but now I have this 2ah squared plus 6c, and I'm not sure what to do with that. So let's go back up. All right, I know I have these three points. Uh, can I give the coordinates here? Well, uh, when I put in negative h into p, then the coordinate here is going to be negative h comma, oh boy, okay, negative h in for t squared, I'll get a h squared. And then I'll have minus bt. Okay, there's a t there plus c. All right, now this coordinate, ah, oh, this is where it's so nice that we centered everything. The t is zero. So the first two summons are zero. And so I just get a c. So this is zero comma c. And then the third piece, okay, that's when I put in h, I'll get h comma a h squared plus b, oop, this should have been an h, not a t, plus b h plus c. Okay, so I have these, these three outputs that I know. And I can, right, the three outputs, which are essentially, right, this is my f of negative h, my uh, f of zero, and my f of h, right? In fact, let's write that down below. So my f of negative h, okay, which I can think of this as my t zero, right? So this is going to be my, my t zero. This was equal to a times h squared minus bh plus c. And f of 0, okay, my 0 is my t1. That was just equal to c. And f of h, that was my t2. That's equal to a h squared plus b h plus c. Now, we wanted to know what this expression meant. But look at this, a h squared, and well, there's two of them. And look, I got an a h squared and an a h squared. What if I just added these two outside values together? I would get two a h squareds. Ooh, okay, so let me do that. I'm gonna do f of negative h, and I'm gonna add an f of h. And you say, well, there's, why do you have all that extra space? Well, we'll see in a moment. When I add those together, I get two copies of a h squared. Okay, what about this, these middle terms? Well, oh my goodness, this is amazing. Minus bh and plus bh, those go away. And then I get two copies of c. Okay, so I get plus 2c. Now, that's really close to what I got up here. What am I missing? Well, I need 6c, not 2c. Okay, so I just need four more c's. But look at this f of zero in the middle. That is equal to c. So I just need to include four copies of f of zero. And that's where the magic four comes in in Simpson's rule. It's exactly what we need to add in order to make these things all match up. And so I can rewrite this uh, value for the integral under the uh, of, of the parabola. I can rewrite it now as, well, let me see. I'll just let's drag this up a little bit. Oops. Let's... Uh, Let's drag this up a little bit higher. All right, so this is going to equal what's inside the parentheses. And if I now put some parentheses outside and write equals h over 3, I get that when I have a curve and I approximate it with a parabola, if I then compute the integral for that parabola, I'm going to get exactly h over 3 times the value of the function at the initial point, 4 times the value of the function in the middle, plus the value of the function at the right end point. That's really cool. That's really cool. And so this is where Simpson's rule is coming from. All right, that's it, right? That was our question, right? We knew in the two interval case, it had to look exactly like this, and now it does. And if you want to put it together for higher order cases, right, you just do it like with the four interval case. You just shove them together, and you're going to get some duplicates, and that's why you get those coefficients of two. All right, so this is where Simpson's rule is coming from. Not too shabby, everybody. All right, take care.